we still have um, some folks coming in, but I know that we're eager to hear from our speaker. Um, so my name is Jane Huckabee. I direct the International Human Rights Clinic here at the Law School. And it's my great pleasure uh, to be moderating today's event, where we'll be hearing from Professor Sam Moyne, who's a professor of law and professor of history at Yale University, on the topic, Humane, the Politics and Poetics of Endless War. So a, a quick background, this particular event is part of our Human Rights in Practice series here at the Law School um, that is co-sponsored by the International Human Rights Clinic and the Centre for International Comparative Law. Um, given the nature of today's topic and, and the breadth of interest in, in having Professor Moyne here at the Law School, the event also has a number of co-sponsors, um, including Duke Law's Centre on Law, Ethics and National Security, or LENS, uh, the Duke Human Rights Centre at the Franklin Humanities Institute, the Duke Human Rights Centre at the Keenan Institute for Ethics, and the Human Rights Law Society and the International Law Society. The format of the event is going to, we're going to hear from Professor Moyne, and then we're going to have the chance to open the floor uh, to a moderated Q&A, so I encourage you to develop and hold on to your questions um, for that time period. But for the moment, um, Sam, the floor is yours. Great. Uh Hi there. Uh, thanks to Aya and Jane for organizing this and all the co-sponsors. Thanks for taking your valuable Friday uh, afternoon to come to this. Uh, I am going to talk about something I, as of yet, know very little about uh, because I'm just taking some guesses. Uh, it, it's starting out a project I haven't researched or started to write. Uh, so that's selfish and useful for me to uh, put myself out with maximum exposure uh, because I can find out what what parts of of my thinking right now primitive though it is you know can't survive your demolition and what parts I might be able to shore up if I work really hard on it um, so please I'll try to be brief and then you can you know tell me where I've gone so dreadfully wrong so Basic question you might ask is, what if anything's wrong with the war on terror, the so-called forever war uh, on which America's embarked? Um, and of course, lots of people must think nothing. Uh, and then some people might think a lot of different things. Uh, and the question is, what's the right answer? Um, so probably the dominant mainstream answer uh, amongst those who are reformists who think that it needs to be changed or corrected in some way uh, is that the war is inhumane uh, and in particular uh, the toll of civilian deaths uh, even or especially once the war has shifted away from its classic heavy footprint territories of Afghanistan and Iraq and become more a light or no footprint war involving drones or missiles from the air or uh, a light footprint special forces operations, uh, which uh, touched 150 countries last year. That's three quarters of the countries. Uh, and the dominant answer is that there are, there's too much mess uh, too many civilians are dying. Uh, that was an answer that we found in a famous uh, human rights clinic report uh, called Living Under Drones. That's the dominant criticism uh, of the drone part of the war, so the no footprint part of the war, you might say. Uh, and uh, there was an extremely graphic extremely well-reported article in the New York Times Magazine by a couple of heroic journalists who went out uh, uh, and, and tried to show, and I think very successfully showed, that the Pentagon uh, is embroiled in a syndrome of undercounting, misreporting the number of civilians who've lost their lives in the war. So that's the standard answer. Uh, and I want to flirt with, let's say, a version of the opposite answer uh, today and see what you think. What if the problem with the forever war is that it's too humane? Or maybe if you want to put it slightly more defensively, 
Uh, the trouble is not the way it's conducted, since the Pentagon is right that it's the most humane war ever fought in history. Uh, although, of course, its residual inhumanity is there to be decried uh, with, you know, our, our, our uh, highest voices we can muster, and, and especially when uh, the United States makes alliances and engages in proxy warfare, like today in Yemen, where uh, there's lots more inhumanity than when America takes a direct hand. Um, but uh, maybe the problem is, is not exactly or only or mainly the persisting inhumanity, uh, but the erosion of limits on the initiation and continuation of war uh, uh, in, in international law terms. The problem lies on the USAD Bellum side of the war on terror, not only or so much or, uh, or um, uh, on, on the use and Bellow side. And if you want to get really radical, you can worry that the humanity of the war, the unprecedented humanity with which America is fighting helps entrench the endless and increasingly in geographical terms also unboundaried nature of the war. Uh, so I wanna explore those possibilities. Just, it's, it's, it's to sum an outrageous thing, and I think we'll hear from at least one person who thinks it's debatable to say that this is the most humane war ever fought. Uh, to say that the humanity is actually abetting the erosion of scope conditions chronologically and geographically is yet more offensive, uh, but let's explore it. I was told, because this is a law school and because of who's funding this, I should definitely talk about international law, and that's gonna be important to do so along the way. But I think we shouldn't get too hung up on what the exact sources of law are we're talking about. Um, because, of course, there is international law governing the conduct of hostilities, that use in bellow law, so-called, that's branded itself since the 1960s precisely international humanitarian law. But it's relevant to the military because there's a statutory version of it, and not just because the United States has ratified the Geneva Conventions. Um, and then when it comes to the initiation and continuation of war, there's a multi-level um, amount, a uh, 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 set of, of laws. There's you know, of course, statutory, like the War Powers Resolution. Uh, there's constitutional, like whatever you think the War Powers arrangements in the Constitution are, and of course there's the UN Charter and whatever other international law you think governs force. And just as a hypothesis, let's put out there that the War on Terror, as just to bottom line it, has been about more and more scrupulous adherence to the law at all levels, national and international, governing conduct of hostilities in a collaborative project between the military and humanitarians, though they struggle at the margins over how much humanity is required. What's really gotten lost and eroded are the constraints national statutory and constitution and international over when the country may use and continue to use force, whether we're interested in the War Powers Resolution, the, the authorization to use a military force, which has become, in, through interpretation, authorization for war nearly anywhere, perpetually on an installment plan, or international law, which the United States, when it comes to the initiation of force, uh, including when it's facing uh, so-called terrorists that uh, adversary states are unwilling or unable to control, the United States generally has ignored far more bluntly than, war, than law controlling hostilities. So this leads me in a, a, a very strange place, uh, certainly in a law school like this, which is reading a novel 
um, in particular, War and Peace, the most important novel ever written about war. And lo and behold, when you read it, you find that Leo Tolstoy, the author of that novel, puts in the mouth of one of his characters the worry that to the extent we make war more humane, we risk entrenching it, uh, making it harder to end. Uh, and the question is, first of all, is that true? Was it ever true? Is it true now of America's war? And if so, what's the response? So Prince Andre says, I wouldn't take prisoners. Uh, this is actually written I think in direct response to the earliest law of war project, um, which has to do with European states in the first Geneva Convention legalizing how soldiers would be treated if kept, if captured or wounded. That change alone, he says, would tr alone, sorry, would transform the whole aspect of war and make it less cruel. If there were none of this playing at generosity and warfare, We'd never go to war except for something worth facing certain death for. Playing at war, that's what's vile. And playing at magnanimity and the rest of it. They talk of the laws of warfare, what we now call international humanitarian law, and humanity to the wounded, and so on. That's all rubbish. Now, there's something very debatable in this position, which is not clearly Tolstoy's because it's a character's, not his. And I'm actually much more interested in what happened to Tolstoy when he embraced uh, you know, Jesus as his uh, savior and tried to figure out what it meant to be his follower. Uh, uh, and yet, already in this uh, argument, there's something, I think, quite interesting. There's a wrong way to take it, I think, which is the idea that as a causal matter, if we were less humane in war, we would have less war. That seems debatable. It seems that there were all kinds of inhumane wars in the past that went on for a very long time. And so it's not obvious we can sustain Tolstoy's or Prince Andre's point in that regard. But let's see if there's any way we can sustain it to figure out if there's any moral problem with the dominant view that our task is to make America's endless war more humane. So after he became a Jesus freak, Tolstoy broadened out his worry about war to a worry about violence, physical violence in general, corporal violence in general. And he looks at the attempt to make war humane in a, in a comparative light. First, he looks back to chattel slavery, after whose abolition he's basically living and writing. And he says, remember all of the people who said that either the only hope or the first step was to make slavery humane. And it's true. Actually, most of the law regarding slavery, that was passed in lots of jurisdictions, including in the US South, including in this part of it was called amelioration law. And its goal was to make masters kinder to their chattel slaves. Uh, now, there were some who believed that if you made chattel slavery more humane, we would ultimately abolish chattel slavery because we would be doing so because we recognize the humanity of our slaves. But Tolstoy said that was unbelievable at the time. It was right for William Lloyd Garrison and the others to protest the attempt to make slavery more humane and demand that it be abolished, where it could as soon as it could. Uh, and so that's his past case. And then he looks at uh, the law of war, which advances in his time. Tolstoy's around long enough not just to comment on the first Geneva Convention, but also on the Hague Regulations, which are the kind of a, a big deal in the law of war, not least since the conferences that led to uh, these uh, weapons regulations chiefly were called by his own uh, tsar. Uh, and he's facing down a law of war community in Geneva 
like the founders of the Red Cross that have a similar idea as those who counseled melioration of slavery. We actually have good evidence that the founders of the Red Cross believed that making war humane would provide the foundation for its abolition. And Tolstoy said, don't bet on it. What could happen is you make war more acceptable to enough people that it goes on endlessly. Now, I don't think that worry of his was very plausible, except now it is. Uh, and I'm wondering if we should pay it some heed. He also said very interesting things about some other corporal practices. Just in the interest of time, I'll skip capital punishment. Though, of course, we've seen in our own jurisdiction, the United States, attempts to struggle with whether to humanize or abolish. Uh, and we could well worry that Maybe we shouldn't tinker with the machinery of death in Justice Blackmun's famous phrase, uh, but just be abolitionists. Of course, we could ask, you know, what happens when we're abolitionists and don't have enough, you know, of a movement behind us and so forth. But Tolstoy's really interesting. I think best example wasn't any of these that have to do with humans, but with non-human animals. He's, he's witness also to a big campaign to make slaughterhouses more uh, humane, if that's the right word. It's really unfair that we use brutality to refer to human cruelty. Uh, but at any rate, people talked about being more humane to animals, founding humane societies, and so forth, uh, when humans are the ones who are the brutes, if you will. And yet Tolstoy worried that those who set out to make slaughterhouses less horrible for the animals involved would make meat production much harder to challenge and much more massive. And on that point, he's clearly correct, I think. I mean, that's what's happened. That's what's happening in the United States. Uh, not just the distance, but the fact that even within a slaughterhouse where almost no one sees the killing of animals that we eat, our cattle, there are still legal provisions and even Department of Agriculture authorities in the slaughterhouse to make sure that the animals aren't killed too horribly. Suggest that we care that our violence is inflicted humanely, but it can keep going. So I don't know. Is this a useful framework for thinking about the forever war? Let's consider. We wouldn't ever want to say irresponsibly that the humanity of our current war, for all its faults, is the main, let alone the only reason, why it keeps on going. Uh, with no anti-war movement in sight, although, as we'll see later, there may well be anti-war sentiment among the American population on both sides of what we take to be the conventional political spectrum. Lots of reasons. Uh, some of you might say, well, there are terrorists, so as long as there are terrorists, we have to fight them. Uh, and it's not, it's not the result of the way we're regulating the war that it's going on forever or the legal regime we have, either when it comes to initiation or continuation or the hostilities themselves that's at fault, but the fact that there's an enemy. Now, that's a perfectly, you know, that's the normal view out in, out in, out in the world, I would say. Of course, we can debate whether that's true, and we can debate whether the war on terror is, is perpetually creating the enemies that then have to be uh, interdicted and so forth. But this is an open debate, which I can't possibly win right now. What I'm more interested in is all these other factors that have been cited, I think, correctly, that are probably more important in explaining why there's broad enough support for humanization to have had one big change to the war on terror in the middle of George W. Bush's administration when it was legalized. 
including through significant court cases like Hamdan v. Rumsfeld. Uh, and the war, whatever your criticisms of it, was made much more legalized and humane on the conduct of hostilities side of things. Uh, uh, but on the other side, the initiation and continuation, erosion of controls, including and maybe especially under the last president, uh, Barack Obama. So I don't have time probably because we want to really, I really want to have this attacked to go through other factors that you might cite as the really important ones. But then there's the last on the list. Is Tolstoy right to whatever extent that the priority we've given as lawyers, not just outside the military, but within it, as much as we might disagree on opposite sides of that divide, to make war more and more humane relative to the past counterinsurgencies America's conducted, most obviously the Vietnam War. Does that fact help account for the endlessness of the war? And if you want to give it further, the expansion of its scope? I think maybe. So, but I, again, just to conclude, I think we have to take care it's a dangerous hypothesis. Um, as you see, Tolstoy's implication is almost like you have a forced choice. Either you give up war or you make it more humane. Well, that's ridiculous to suggest that we have to choose one or the other. We could and should do both if we you know, are a reformist of a certain kind. But maybe there's a way of recuperating his argument maybe more responsibly than the way he made it. Maybe there are big risks to adopting a reformist project that's too focused on making war more humane. Because you neglect another possible agenda which you might have to balance with your goal of making war more humane. Now, it'll be more controversial. You'll have less common ground, maybe, with the military in, in tussling with them over what the Geneva Conventions mean and so forth. But it's open to legal reformers to talk a lot more about use ad bellum law or constitutional war powers or that old statute, the War Power Resolution, than reformers have been doing. Uh, and if they did so, they might counteract the risks that come with making war more humane, as we've done, creating, I think, something new in the world, uh, a new kind of humane war for all its faults. Now, I'll just close, since I may have misled some of you by putting the word poetics in the title, which is probably a word not allowed in this building. Uh, and it's true I talked about Tolstoy, but I didn't talk about poetics. So I'll just say in closing, I don't think law makes that much difference in general, uh, except as a lag variable. What does change our tolerance for violence abroad? Well, I think the answer is poetry broadly conceived. Uh, literary artists who can bring home to enough people the realities of war, especially in, after conscription when our brothers and sons and husbands, and now today women too, are, aren't fighting uh, out on the field, especially as the war becomes light or no footprint. Uh, and I think our poets have failed, failed us. All the war literature since 9-11 is like Vietnam-era literature, and reasonably enough since there were heavy footprint wars along the way in Afghanistan and Iraq. And yet, do we have a literature that brings home to enough people this new humane form of warfare fought through drones and special forces? Not to the best of my knowledge. So uh, maybe. Uh, you know, you shouldn't drop out of law school, but maybe someone should uh, think about 
the poetics and not just the politics of humane war. Thanks so much. And thank you, Sam. Although I'm disappointed when you said you were going to end on poetics, I was hoping for a poem. <laughs> but um, let's go forward. Um, as you had foreshadowed, um, I would raise a question about the definition of the current war on terror, particularly after the initial engagement of the Bush administration, that it is the most humane. And to think and want to hear more from you about how you define the nature and scope of harm in this context. It can't be casualties alone, right? I mean, that would exclude um, non-fatal violence. It would exclude secondary and tertiary victims. Um, and it can't just be US drone warfare, because that would exclude, as you mentioned, the variety of ways in which the war on terror has morphed into a series of proxy arrangements as well. So if we begin to kind of broaden our sense you know, in this way, how do we think differently about harm? And just a final part of that question, when I was reflecting on your presentation, in my work with victims of the US war on terror, harm is comprised of the um, initial violation, and there's a, a lot of harm that's linked to the injury or the trauma, and in some cases, of course, a fatality, depending on the circumstance. But a lot of the harm derives from a lack of a remedy, right? A lack of ability to rely on the law to provide an account, you know, to provide a recognition of harm. And if, as you say, it's true that the current moment we're in is the moment where there are no legal limits, right, where the chance of accountability is so off the table, then isn't that the most profoundly harmful situation in which individuals might find themselves? If we think about harm in these... Only if they're still away. alive. Only if they're still alive. Uh, so I, I, I do want to acknowledge, that, like, the great force of that point, especially the claim, you know, the, the claim that this war is the most humane war ever fought, um, is sustainable only insofar as we neglect the fact that um, aside from, you know, this, you know, um, various parts of the military that do things like self-investigate and then provide these salatia payments, mm -hmm. which is actually a very important widespread practice nowadays. Uh, there's an amazing book I've, I've just uh, reviewed uh, that uh, everyone should read by Nick McDonald called The Bodies in Person mm -hmm. that is, is kind of a detailed um, investigation of the moral management and, and, mm -hmm. and including when it comes to Salatia payments. But um, clearly that's not accountability. Mm -hmm. um, and so your, your point is very forceful, as is your point about secondary and tertiary, um, you know, victims. But, you know, so... I, but I would say that many people would, would start with the proposition that the worst thing that can happen in war is, is death, um, especially of civilians. Uh, although I myself think it, the focus on civilians, uh, although the law privileges them, may not make as much moral sense as we think because, um, you know, there are lots of soldiers uh, who are human beings too, and in fact, all of them. Uh, so, I, and, and they die and they suffer also lots of grievous harm and tertiary, secondary and tertiary harm. Uh, but if we begin with the proposition that death is the worst thing, uh, then I, I just don't believe that any, that, you know, um, that, that my claim can like really be challenged given the scope of death, um, both to civilians and soldiers in prior war. So um, I, I, I also would venture to say that, you know, if we're advocates and focus on the remaining shortcomings, our temptation is then to magnify them, which is what you do as an advocate. But if that involves us denying that the U.S. military and allied militaries, mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reasons, instrumental reasons, political reasons, um, is, is trying to abide by some uh, uh, laws governing the conducts of hostilities, 
to a totally unprecedented and indeed shockingly unprecedented extent, then, then we haven't been honest to, to like a big change. And so I, where I think, you know, where I think I'm, I'm sort of um, like really put kind of put back to square one with your question is we do have to have a like a metric for defending this claim. Is it, I mean, because you can claim that someone who's immediately killed doesn't suffer. Uh, and, you know, as one of my slides says, we have a lot more wounded, for example, in this, in this, in this form of warfare. Um, maybe we argue that if you somehow got out your utilitarian tote board, it wouldn't be as easy to defend my claim given, you know, the new kinds of harms psychologists are willing to find mm -hmm. and so forth. But in the end, can anyone really doubt that death is the worst thing, the thing they'd most like to prevent in war, and that it's diminished largely because of the self-regulation of the military under pressure to a historically remarkable extent. So I have follow-ups so I'm gonna sit on, so I can see many hands already. Um, Professor Dunlap. Or getting too precise. And basically what he says when you, I, I'm doing this from memory, but uh, whether it's in this article or another article, some people say that the reason Germany and Japan were, went from militarism and aggression and turned within a few years into almost pacifistic states was because they had been brought down to bare metal as a society. What Friedman talked about in the Iraq war because of the use of precision weapons and that we didn't kill off the, the uh, Sunni officer corps, that set the stage because the Iraqis never felt they were really defeated. Ergo, you know, we have 15 years of war. But what the answer to it is, uh, I think, is that's what you need to explore. Uh, and some people in the military would say this. Um, the problem is not the law of war. Complying with the law of war is not that difficult. Uh, it is the policy restraints that are placed on top of it. For example, when the president, and this is a policy Trump's carrying through, announces to the public, we are not going to conduct a strike if even one civilian is in danger. The enemy goes to school on that. So now, as you know, they carry around children in those uh, you know, so that, because they know the, the drone's looking at them. And, uh, and so I think that is, is one of the problems. And so perhaps the answer is not abandoning the law, but rather rethinking the utility of these policy-driven decisions. Because uh, I've written about this thing called the moral hazard of inaction. Because when you don't do a drone strike, people think, well, no civilians are going to be killed. Yeah, they are, actually because the guy you are going to take out, he's going to go and do other things. So I think you have something here. I, I wish I could help you, you more, but I think it's worth pursuing. So I would encourage you to, to carry forward. You're going to get a lot of criticism because people aren't going to understand what you're trying to do. You're, they're going to think you're talking about Krieg Raison or something like that, and you're not. Uh, so you're, you're, you're going to have to yeah, no, that, that's a really enormously helpful. You know, if you go back to the 19th century, you know, when Tolstoy was living, I think there were three broad options on the table about what to do with war. Um, I mentioned, too, humanize it or end it, you know, that. So there was a big pacifist movement, unlike anything we've seen since the Vietnam era. Um, but there was also the school of intensifiers um, who wanted to make war more intense and extreme, um, and, and, and a lot of Germans, uh, theorists, uh, through the 19th century hewed to this view. Some of them justified their argument, in a sense, by appealing to both the humanitarians and the pacifists, and said, if you let me get impose shock and awe, uh, 
it will be more humane in the long run and peace, a stable peace will come. Uh, so you're, you're kind of, maybe not surprisingly, kind of reminiscent of that old school of thought. I think the trouble that many of us would find is that, is, is that you know, there have been a lot of intensifiers who've made things worse, not more durably peaceful w with lots of civilian harm. And, and that's why the humanization project became so appealing. So what I want to say is, what happened to pacifism? Uh, and, uh, you know, Tolstoy and War and Peace, you, if you read his quote, is, is actually sort of close to the intensification view. But I think as, as time passed and he took Jesus more seriously, uh, he, he verged into a, a much more outright pacifism. Now, I'm not a pacifist but I, I'm a pacifist with respect to the war on terror, and I'm wondering why there aren't more people of that sort. So I've got a bunch of hands, um, so I'm gonna, maybe, are you okay if I take back two questions? Um, Professor Helfer, and then Professor Mike. Okay. Um, so, really interesting talk, and I was thinking um, through Sam of other analogies, right? So you mentioned the death penalty. And I was trying to think about, are there other situations where we do have a total prohibition, and does it stick? Um, and so I, the things that came to mind, um, some of them are um, you know, use in bellow, things like a nuclear war or chemical weapons. Um, and I guess the prohibition on torture could go in there, too. And I'm just thinking through. How that so we we have not had a, a nuclear war other than if you put aside the end of World War II, um, and but the legal rules on there are a little bit sort of murky, right? I mean, you can't maybe you can't use them, but you can probably stockpile them if you haven't joined on to certain treaties. But but at least we haven't completely sure. destroyed each other. Um, chemical weapons, we used to think, okay, we've kind of finally gotten rid of them, and now they're making a comeback, and there doesn't seem to be very much at all that, at least in this one area of the world, that we're going to deter it. So I was trying to think, well, where does, do these kinds of examples place within what you're talking about? And I guess with respect to, say, the death penalty or a particular kind of um, awful uh, armament or, or weapon, um, you, you can engage in the basic activity without that, right? You, uh, and similarly for the death penalty, you can, you can punish, you can put somebody, you know, you impose really serious deterrent punishments um, without, by getting, and still get rid of the conduct you find most offensive. It's not clear to me that we can really ever get rid of it. I think you alluded to this in your talk. We're never going to really get rid of war. And then the question is, what's the baseline? If the baseline question is this conduct is going to happen, then what's the second best option that we can get to? So with certain things, I think it's fair to say, and may, maybe it depends on how you slice it, with certain kinds of conduct, it's fair to say, we actually could get to zero, right? So our first best option potentially is there, and then we have just a means question. But if you take as a different baseline, you know, that there's going to be some of this conduct, so torture is another example, right? We keep, we're still torturing, right? Notwithstanding any prohibition. So I'm just wondering if that helps to sort of, to, to, yeah. We've got a, a, quite a healthy queue, yeah. so I'm just going to um, sort of add a few more questions in, and then we'll go back. Um, Professor Michaels. Uh, you not so much so far on defining the war part. You defining mean, what? What, war. what you mean by war. Oh, I see. So you speak yeah. of this war, you speak of the endless war. I learned about the endless war from uh, Mary Dujak, makes the point that the distinction between war and non-war has become much blurrier than it was before, which would suggest that the more war becomes like peace, peace also becomes more like war. And if you focus only on a certain subpart that you define narrowly as war, you may miss some of the bigger picture of what should or should not be uh, humane. So narrowly, I think I'd want you to define what you mean by war, what you're looking at. And broadly, I'd want you to take that type of consideration into account. Do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah. I'm also just wondering how this paradigm works with like the economics of war. I mean, how do you factor in the fact that there are 
you know, institutions outside of the military and, you know, the parties of war that profit off of war and that, you know, have an interest in maintaining war. Okay, those are all amazing uh, insights. I mean, I, I have thought a bit, Larry, about about your challenge. Actually, one thing you said at, at the very beginning, I think, should be, you know, underlined because it's quite insightful, which is that, you know, within what, what I was calling the humanization of war, there are some abolitionist impulses, like with respect to particular practices. And presumably what we call Hague law is partly like abolitionist movement with respect to certain kinds of weapons. Um, but the baseline issue is, I think, fundamental to, you know, this idea of Tolstoy and comparative abolition. So um, his point is that lots of people thought for, for eons that slavery uh, was, you know, not possible to edit out of the human experience. The best that could be done was to make it more humane. Um, and that, you know, pr proved incorrect, although we could, of course, argue that its functional equivalents remain, you know, alive and well. Um, it still was meaningful to be an abolitionist with respect to slavery and then face down uh, you know, the functional equivalence, I would, I would say. Um, you know, the central task in, in international law was the Pacific resolution of disputes for most of modern history. And there was a huge amount of labor and success uh, on that front. Uh, and so to call, call, call a defeat in advance, um, in, in especially when we have these statutory constitutional and international limits on initiation and continuation of, of force seems like, you know, we, we wouldn't want to give up too soon and prematurely conclude that we're dealing with an inevitable, inevitable phenomenon to humanize. Um, yeah, Ralph makes a really, I mean, that's a fantastic point. I mean, I, I, I really like Mary's work, but it's still the case that um, for all the, the, the move to proxy warfare with a horrible toll for the world that uh, America undertook between Vietnam when it was forced off the battlefield and 9-11 when it was allowed to get back on it, uh, that move after 9-11 was still very significant. Uh, and so I think we're on firm ground, even if we want to talk about, you know, proxy violence and so forth. And, the, you know, you could argue that the endless war goes back to 1947 or 41 or 1492, but it still could be legitimate to talk about ending this form of it or this version of it. Now, I think we talked about this last night. We'd have to contend with whether that would send us back to a form of proxy war just as bad or worse. Is that really plausible? First of all, we already have proxy war in Yemen. So it's not like that we, don't, we aren't already doing that. And it's hard for me, as with Larry, to, to, to worry too much about you know, cleaning up the residual um, forms that violence might take once we target the war itself. Let's try that, at least, and see, see what happens. Uh, judge the risks in advance, but, you know, why not? And, 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 and you're right, of course, that a big thing driving this is uh, arms procurement, arms sales. Uh, you know, Dwight Eisenhower, a great Republican, warned us about that, and, and we're living it. I mean, that, I think, came home to us when we saw images from, you know, the Yemeni battlefield of our company's shells lying on the ground. And that's, that. so, you know, a, a big question is, is what would a pacifist movement, were there ever to be one again, uh, concern itself with? And presumably, it would have to take this on, too. So we've got a bunch of Matthew, Professor Young, and then we'll come to the side and then back down to you. Uh, I'm Matthew Kramer. I'm a 3L at Duke. Uh, and I guess what I'm wondering is that your, your idea that as war grows more humane, we become more comfortable with it. I'm wondering where you draw this distinction between humane and really visibility. 
Ukraine. Because I feel like visibility is the, a much more important factor than the idea of like humanity or being okay with casualties. Rather, it's just that we've shifted uh, the, our exposure to those casualties and then our own exposure of our own soldiers. And I don't think that's a uniquely a modern <laughs> phenomenon. You've been talking some about you know, the Vietnam War, which was very visible because of a lot of exposure of US soldiers on the ground. But we also dropped an incredible amount of bombs on Laos all throughout in a shadow war that was never formally declared. Uh, and that doesn't get any real attention or, you know, poets haven't written about it. It doesn't have the, the oh, same right. modern. So isn't it that war is just becoming less and less visible to the American public rather than right. humane? I really like this project. I, th I think most of it seems absolutely right to me. I just had a couple of thoughts. The, and the first was I was surprised not to hear more about the Cold War and mutual assured destruction because it seems like that's the ultimate example for you. That's the ultimate intensification of war. And it suggests at least under certain conditions, if you take it to the limit you know, of global suicide, then the intensifiers were right. Yeah. Um, the other thought was, as a domestic constitutional lawyer, you got me thinking about the rules for initiating conflict. And, and it does seem to me that those rules in, in our society are, in large part, a, a function of a unique historical moment and a unique correlation of forces, if you will, because we are a weak country. Um, we are amidst superpowers. We are in a legalistic period where there's a real concern with giving any just cause for war, right? And so anything you do that gets on the wrong side of the British or the French or you know, who you know are lusting after your territory anyway is likely to bring you into a you know, potentially you know, existential conflict, right? And so we have a very strict rule that anything you do that initiates a state of war, even in the smallest way, has to be approved by the Congress. That's not our situation now. Right? And, and the idea of low-intensity conflict is a lot more thinkable to us now. I would submit that the rules, the old rules about conflict being hard to initiate constitutionally are much more honored the closer we get to a scenario where these consequences for the nation are likely to be real. And so for any major commitment, whether it's even legally required or not, the president tends to go to Congress right? for, for the Iraq War. The president goes to Congress. For the initiation of the war on terror, the president goes for Congress. I think it's interesting that FDR goes to Congress after Pearl Harbor when he doesn't have to as a matter of law because the state of, law, of war actually already exists, right? And so I wonder if one implication, that may or may not be friendly to your project, is we need, as a matter of these rules of initiation, we need more than one category. Right? And, and maybe it needs, maybe it ought to be easier to initiate conflict if it doesn't have those kinds of existential consequences. Yep. Okay, so I'm just wondering where you draw the line for how intense you should allow this intensification to be. It seems like you're doing some sort of utilitarian calculus here, and what it sounds like you're saying to me is if you had a trolley problem where you had the fat man to save the five and you're saying push him off the bridge. Yeah. So is there a limit to how intense you think it could be, and how would you draw that line? Great. OK, um, wonderful. Uh, so with respect to the first question, you know, it, that's, that was profound. Um, it's just that we have a very large literature um, on war at a distance, which is the name of one of the great books on the topic. And, and it illustrates, indeed, that the relation of, of domestic publics to the war, their empires fight, in that was the British Empire in the case of that book, uh, is indeed very old. Uh, you know, another book uh, you, know, you might uh, know about is Susan Sontag's a book regarding the lives of others, and, and it's fundamentally about you know, the, the distance and the way that images might be able to lessen it for us in certain circumstances, but uh, as, a, as a phenomenon, it's significant. Um, I just think that the human, humanity adds something new, not that it displaces the distance or is even the major factor, but is a new one that hasn't been effectively commented upon, which is all, I mean, all I can do is write books. Um, and that's why I made a special point of saying, even in the slaughterhouse, 
uh, when there's distance imposed on the site of killing the cattle, even from the workers in the slaughterhouse, 99% of them, there are these new, newer, supervening rules that those people in secret uh, have to kill the cow humanely. Uh, and I'm, that's what's happening in war, too, since Vietnam. And so I, I'm not claiming, I, I don't want to make a strong causal claim because maybe the distance would do the job without it. Maybe if in the slaughterhouse those rules were lifted and the distance were all that, all that we needed to keep doing it, uh, you know, it would turn out the human, humanity made no difference, and the same could be true in war. Uh, but I doubt it. Um, I think we know that, our, that we're fighting this, and at least some of us, especially the more liberal we get, can take solace in the fact that it's being fought increasingly within the confines of, 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 these, of this humanitarian law. Now, there are some who want to add human rights law, which we could get into. Um, those were fantastic comments. Um, I would just note that there wasn't a one-time only history for war powers, you know, where there was a fledgling country that then became a superpower. Uh, although, um, of course, basically that's, that's, that's got to be the main narrative because there was the post-Vietnam moment. And, you know, all of us teach, you know, John Ely's democracy and distrust or the ideas therein and Caroline products and all of that. But his great book was War and Responsibility, which was about this moment of opportunity to revisit war powers, uh, you know, and, and actually as predictions about the war powers resolution and why it's been gutted, including by the latest administration and one of my own colleagues working in it, it is actually like in that book from the early 80s. Um, so I would say, you know, maybe we relax things a bit and, and ask whether there's more play in the system, even for a superpower, with respect to some of these statutory regimes and, and maybe even constitutional understandings, and especially like deference to prevailing understandings of international law outside the country. So do we have to live in, a, a, a world where like a university professor coins a theory that allows you to intervene in a country if they're if the country's unwilling or unable to control its terrorists and the US takes it on board even though most international lawyers outside the country think it's bunk no uh, so that seems like a plausible change I do you know you said something very important about like the probable factual conditions under which Congress, dysfunctional it is, might as assume a role of oversight. And obviously, we're not near that. Uh, the question is, what was going on? Could we have the functional equivalent of the conditions that prevailed not so much at the founding, but after Vietnam, which in the end was a counterinsurgent war abroad like the one we're fighting now? Probably we're nowhere near those conditions, whatever they are, but still it's worth thinking about. Um, I'm not an intensifier. Um, Tolstoy, I think, flirted with the, that idea and, and Professor Dunlap even more. Um, but then it's on them to say, like, how do we know when, like, especially since we're engaged in prediction, that the shock and awe we perpetrate is going to be worth it in terms of the durable peace it creates or the lives saved, given that the shock and awe in the short term is going to be ghastly in its consequences. That's why I reject intensification in favor of pacifism. Um, but of course, others do not, neither then nor now. We have time for one more, one more question. Hi, um, my name's Karen Huber. I'm a 1L and also associate professor of history at Wesleyan College. So two hats. Um, Me too. <laughs> good feeling. Um, I'm really interested in something that didn't come up in your definition of what is humane, which is the role of what is possible, and in particular, technology. The things that we are able, the decisions we're able to make today are so radically different from, for example, the period I study in World War I, um, or if we go back in this country's history, back to you know, the, the horrific things we saw during um, the conflicts with Native Americans or the Civil War, you just see a, a very different amount of possibility 
total, I mean, clearly, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the case. But maybe we shouldn't overstate the, 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 the idea that, like, the technological deterministic approach to which that might lead, that, like, you fight the wars you can. Clearly, you know, we can be more humane because we have the tools to do it, uh, as imperfect as they are. But, I mean, I would argue that the United States fought the war on terror one way from 2001 to three and pivoted. Uh, first of all, it legalized the conflict, and it just engaged since then in, in a new approach to it. Now, it turned out that the rise of drones made that moral choice m m feasible in a way that, that, that wouldn't, couldn't have been imagined even in 2003. But, you know, no reason a drone, you know, under the regime of 2001 through three can't, you know, be imprecise in order to cause shock and awe and maybe, you know, intensify conflict in the name of, you know, the future good. So it really depends on what our moral approach is and the ends to which we decide to put the technology, though of course it matters what it can do. That's why I would say, you know, let's beware of, of, of overemphasizing drones and underemphasizing special forces in our current form of war, given their deployment in the three quarters of the countries I mentioned, um, and, and their major persisting role in global order. I regret that we have to bring our conversation to a close. It was, a, it was an engaging presentation and back and forth in the Q&A. So thank you very much, um, Professor Moyne, for being here. Um, and we look forward to seeing many of you at our future events in our Human Rights in Practice series. Thank you.